Hi and welcome back to a new video. You can also see this is a new part of the Hardware Legends video series because on Monday I thought, hey, Tuesday is bank holiday, I will just spend my Tuesday using the Asus Mars One, which is sitting in the back right here, and pair it with a latest system like the 12900K. Turned out it was not that easy and for whatever reason it is almost impossible to boot the Asus Mars One on this board or this system. I'm not sure why that's the case. At a certain time I just skipped over to the Mars Two, which in my opinion is also one of the most legendary cards ever made. Maybe that will never change anymore because at a certain point Nvidia decided to change their policy about graphics cards that vendors like Asus are not open anymore to do those kind of custom designs because at a certain point they also made the Mars 3 which never came to the market unfortunately. It would have been amazing. There are like two or three samples which are available somewhere out there. Some collectors got them but it's completely impossible to get one of the Mars 3. But the Mars 2 in my opinion is still one of the like most interesting cards retrospectively ever made. And that's why we're going to check how this card was built, how it's made. We will tear it apart and then also put it on the 12900K and see what kind of performance we can get on a nowadays platform. The Mars 2 was launched in July 2011, which nowadays makes this card almost 11 years old. And from my personal perspective, anything that's older than like 10 years can almost be considered retro hardware. So I kind of would treat this, treat this as a retro hardware, but it's more like a legendary piece, that's why it's in the legendary hardware series. What made this card so special is the fact that it was very limited. Compared to most of the graphics cards, which are made in 10,000s or maybe 100,000s of pieces, this was only produced 1,000 times or 999 times. That meant it was extremely limited, but also at a very, very high price. In 2011, the normal GTX 590 was sold for about 600 euro, and this was sold for almost 1,300 euro. Back then, if you said you're going to buy a Mars 2, everybody thought you're just completely stupid. And if you now compare it to today's market prices, 1,300 euro is not even special anymore. But due to the fact that the card is extremely limited and it's pretty much impossible to find one, that's still making this one of the like rarest cards and most interesting cards for collectors out there. The card features dual GF110 Fermi 2.0 GPUs, which are clocked about 25% higher than on an ordinary GTX 590. And that's also a bit special for this card, because if you check a card out from today, like an RTX 3080 or whatever, they always only have an overclocking headroom of like 3%, maybe 4%, something in that perspective. But something like this, like 25% from factory. And then there is still overclocking headroom for maybe another five to, in good way, maybe 10%. That is not possible to do anymore because nowadays everything is completely bent to the limit and overclocking at home is not as fun anymore as it used to. But just the performance uplift you got from a normal GTX 590 to the Mars 2 almost kind of made sense why the card was so expensive. Apart from the specs, the availability and the price, which were completely special, the entire appearance was also completely nuts and special. Now just compare the GTX 590 Mars II to an RTX 3080 Ti. Just looking at the card, it's completely insane how big this card is. It's a triple slot design. Also the fans are enormous and they're also very loud, but they have a very high throughput, which was required because you're running dual GTX 580 GPUs on there overclocked. So the power consumption was rather high. That's also why three times eight pin was necessary. And even though the fans are very loud and have a very high throughput, the cooling itself of the, of the card was not that great to be fully honest. But that's also related to the cooling blocks which are sitting in there. We will look at them in a second. We will completely disassemble the card and look at it. But just inspecting the outside appearance first, the entire frame on top was made out of aluminium, milled I assume, which would also make this a bit more expensive. And if you pay attention to the red thing in front, it's also a nice little special gimmick. This thing right here, looking at it from the side, is the Asus RG logo. So that's a kind of nice little touch they built and hit in the card. If you look at the backside of the Mars 2, we can find a backplate which has no active cooling as far as I know. I never took apart a Mars 2 so far, 
but from what I've seen so far in the past, I don't think there's any like thermal pads underneath. It's just pure mechanical stability and also visuals, obviously. You can also see some cutouts for these big caps on the back. I'm not sure if it's called NEC or NEC, but these big caps were also used on the PlayStation 3, for example. Nowadays, they are typically replaced with these like tiny tantalum caps. It's the same kind of purpose. And these used to blow off on some products. Not sure if that was ever an issue on the Mars 2. But for example, on the PlayStation 3, these sometimes were an issue. Now that the cover is removed, we can inspect the 110 mm fans from the backside. That's quite enormous, to be fully honest. Comparing this with an RTX 3080 Ti, which has an 85 mm fan, just looking at the surface, like the cutout surface, a 110 mm fan has almost twice the surface of an 85 mm fan. So looking at those two, it would mean that you basically have four of them on one card, which is pretty much insane. The card is fully disassembled now. We will first inspect the backside. We already talked about the big caps on the back of the GPU. The GPU is also surrounded by GDDR5 in total 1.5 gigabyte per GPU, which is especially nowadays not much anymore, but even back then 1.5 gigabyte, especially considering the price of the card was a bit on the edge. Three gigabyte per GPU would have been a lot nicer. But what's also very nice is this thing right here, which is called Mod Zone. And it allowed to, for example, disable OCP, disable thermal throttling, and the disabling thermal throttling, for example, would be very helpful for liquid nitrogen overclocking. Sometimes some of these sensors could read out like, I don't know, 65,000 degrees Celsius, and this would help to prevent some kind of like shutdown or protection. And then you have additional pads to unlock some additional higher voltages. Now the coolers, and I talked about them before. Especially if you would see this on a card nowadays, considering the price, then I would not be happy about the cooling solution. Because these blocks are far from being special. They are also far from providing a ton of surface area, which is sometimes a bit sad, especially if you look at the card and it's assembled and you see the fan sitting on top, you will notice that there is like a four or five millimeter gap between the fans and the heat sinks. So there's additional space which should have or could have been used for additional surface area, especially considering the card has a TDP of almost 400 watt. So it requires a lot of cooling. In the end, what I find the most amazing about the Mars 2 is the PCB and the way it's made. You just, you just get bashed by how it looks like. There's so many components on a very little amount of space. You have dual GPUs and a single PCB. But let's start off with the section in the top right. We have three times eight pin connectors. We have a tiny red button next to it, which allows to put the fan to 100% fan speed. So if you're running some kind of benchmark and you think, oh, thermally, this could be on the limit, you just hit the button and it's ramping up to 100% fan speed immediately. Underneath, we can spot these white little components right here. Those are not shunt resistors because back then the cards were not made this way with shunt measuring the power draw or power consumption. It was not made that way, but those are fuses. Ideally, in theory, if you have these fuses and your GPU is still working fine, but you have an issue on the VRM, some MOSFET is blowing up, then this fuse can protect your GPU at least in theory. It feels like that the card is made 50% out of power stages. If you count just the inductors, we have a total of 20 inductors, where the top two on the right side form two phases for the memory of the right GPU. The two on the top left are for the memory of the left GPU. And then we have eight phases for vGPU on the left and eight phases for vGPU on the right. Looking at the components, you can also spot three MOSFETs in each line of each phase. And I would assume that you have dual low side MOSFETs and a single high side MOSFET. Sometimes on some like main boards or graphics cards, you can also find dual high side, dual low side. Nowadays, everything like this is always found in a single package and then called a power stage. The greenish chip in the center is an NVIDIA NF200, which is just a simple bridge chip for combining the single PCI Express 16 lanes 2.0 into splitting up to two GPUs. The cool thing is that I do not only own one Mars 2, but two Mars 2. In theory, we could run Quad SLI, but I'm not sure if that's going to work out on Alder Lake. I will reassemble the card and then we will just plug it in and see what happens.
Obviously the question would be, what about quad SLI? Can we not just use both cards and run both cards in quad SLI? But turned out that it's not so easy anymore running dual cards on a recent platform and also with a recent Windows. Even though that's the German Windows, I will just simply translate it. The error message is pointing out that there are not sufficient resources to run all of the cards. You can see that all four GTX 580 cards are present in the device manager. However, I'm not able to install all four of them. I'm not sure why exactly that's the case, if it's due to not sufficient amount of PCI Express lanes or whatever it might be that we would have to redo this on an older platform with more PCI Express lanes. We will only stick to one card for this video. We'll make things a lot easier. We'll also make it easier for me because then I can plug the NVMe SSD right here and this slot is connected to the chipset as far as I know, because if I plug in any kind of SSD in the top slot of the hero board, neither the card nor the SSD will be detected. I'm not sure if there is like some weird PCI Express protocol conflict because this card is maybe using an older version of it. I don't know. It's pretty weird. If I use any kind of NVMe drive in the upper slot in combination with the card, both will not be detected. Yeah, so that will be a bit easier, but just in idle, you cannot really hear the card. So in idle, it's pretty quiet. Under load, it can also be quite noisy. Close to this, which is pretty much the benchmark mode, but yeah. But you saw in the teardown that none of the components sitting on the PCB, like the high side and low side MOSFETs, none of them are directly cooled from the heatsink. So they require a very high airflow to be also cooled. But I guess it's finally time to perform some benchmarks. When I did the benchmark or gaming selection, I thought about what were the most used and most liked games in 2011 or 2012 and I straight thought about Battlefield 3. Probably the best Battlefield ever made, at least looking at the popularity. Personally, I would prefer Battlefield 4, but Battlefield 3 was also very awesome. Looking at the performance, obviously this is kind of uplifted if you compare it to benchmarks from back then by the 12900K, but I can assure you that running in 1080p and ultra settings, this is still 100% GPU limited, obviously. But we can get about 80 to 90 FPS on average, but looking at the 1% low FPS, you can see that we're in the region of about 30 to 40 FPS and you can feel that. And nowadays GPU would typically achieve in games where you have 80 to 90 FPS, about maybe 50 to 60 in 1% low. And that's also caused by the Nvidia SLI technology, which is one of the big downsides and why this is probably not used anymore or why it's not that common anymore. You can feel it like a little bit of stuttering, even though with 80 and 90 FPS on average, you should not feel that. But yeah, that's the way it is with dual GPU cards. And then also talking about synthetic benchmarks, I was thinking about what kind of benchmarks were recent back then, obviously 3D Mark 11. Also, if we wanted to run the most recent 3D Mark, for example, Time Spy, Time Spy Extreme, or even like Port Royale, those would not run on a GTX 580 or 590, simply because it only supports DirectX 11. But still, the 3D Mark 11 is a benchmark I really liked back then, and just running this again gives me really nice memories back of those cards. And I was checking out some rankings on HWBot simply to get a feeling of what kind of performance I should expect. Then I saw the top score, which is held by Buildsoid with an overclocked GTX 590, just slightly overclocked, and he was running an 8086K CPU. I was also able to overclock my GTX 590 Mars 2 slightly to about 840 megahertz, which then allowed me to achieve a score of 14,407 points. That's quite a bit higher than what he had, but yeah, that's the performance uplift you can get in some benchmarks caused by, for example, the 12900K in this case, even though it was only running at 5 gigahertz. But yeah, I simply just took a screenshot and uploaded it to HWBot because why not get another first place? The most recent benchmark we can still run with the Mars 2 is the 3D Mark Firestrike. The entire setup scored about 9000 points in the normal Firestrike benchmark, but I was more interested in looking at the GT1, which had 44 FPS on average. And just to get you an idea of how much 44 FPS means, this GTX 1050 Ti, which is like a fourth of the size and probably a fourth of the power consumption and probably a fourth of the price, has exactly the same performance. 
but still it has about 25% more performance than a Ryzen 5700G. Just shows you also that some of the APUs, even though they are already quite fast, they are still quite a bit behind on dedicated GPUs. Overall, the Mars 2 is still an incredible card to own and I'm very happy to have two of them in my collection. Overall, I would just wish that companies would make more of these like very special cards, even if they're so limited and even they have technical downsides like the micro stuttering maybe for SLI, but still like those cards, they are the very special cards, at least for me. We will make another video for the Mars 1. If I ever manage to get one of these to run, I have three of them. I thought I have four, but I couldn't find a fourth one. I'm not sure where this is laying around, but yeah, I will check if I can get these to run. Maybe I will just put it on an older setup like a 6700K or something similar. Should be much easier to get it to boot and then just use like Windows 7. Should be a lot simpler. All right, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye bye.